welcome to today's episode of the Boardroom Brain Podcast. We have got an extra special guest on the show today. I can't wait to introduce to you Jenny Blumenthal. Let me tell you a little bit about her. As the CEO and author of Corporate Rehab, Jenny Blumenthal helps female leaders thrive by shifting mindsets and behaviors while we rewrite the rules for corporate America. Jenny spent 20 years as an executive counseling Fortune 500 companies on growth strategy and digital transformation and left during the pandemic pivot. She now coaches executive women to do their own corporate rehab and grow in their existing careers as entrepreneurs. Her book, Corporate Rehab, will be launching this coming October. Jenny, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you on. Oh, thanks so much, Lauren. I'm excited to be here, too. Well, and I should clarify too, because you coach people who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs, but also people who are interested in staying in their existing careers as well, correct? So you're helping those in the corporate space and the entrepreneurial space. Yes, that's right. I really focus on helping leaders thrive in the future of work. And sometimes that's right in the roles, right exactly where they are, getting to that next level without losing themselves. And sometimes it's pivoting into a new job or pivoting into being your own own entrepreneur and figuring out um, what it takes to actually thrive in the future outside of corporate America. And so I do a lot of coaching on that perspective as well. I love it. Well, we're going to break all of that down. And I know our listeners are going to be so eager to hear all the nuggets of wisdom that you have to offer, because I think you really do offer such a unique perspective as someone who has spent so much time in the corporate space and the entrepreneurial space. That's unique to bring both of those worlds together. So everybody's going to get some benefit out of this conversation today. Now, one question I always love to ask our guests, for those of us tuning in on YouTube, people always see my bookshelf behind me. I love to read. We have the Brain Health Book Club every month. So we're always looking for new, exciting reads. Uh, I want to hear what you're reading these days that's inspiring you. And then I also want to hear about this book you're writing too. So tell us a bit about both those things. Sure. Um, well, I can start with um, what I've been inspired by. Um, I think the the best part about writing a book and doing some research about it is you get to actually read all these other fun books for a living. So <laughs> that's really nice. Um, and my book actually did just launch in October. And so now I'm getting people sending me a ton of their books. So that's been really fun because I've been getting to read some, you know, big name authors, some people that wrote their own book that I'm just now getting to consume and and hearing their perspective. So that's been really fun. Um, One of the latest ones I'm looking forward to digging into is Julia Borston's When Women Lead. And it's actually similar format to my book um, and talking about really what happens when we actually get out of our own way. And when we let women lead and fill the C-suites of corporate America, what type of leadership attributes could we expect to see? So I'm excited to read and dig into that one. And the one I just finished was Design Your Life, which is a fun, uh, interactive way to um, get a little bit more intentional about some of the decisions that you make, which was also pretty exciting to read after I had finished my own book and see some of the parallels. So um, those are two that I'm inspired by. Um, and my book is Corporate Amer- or Corporate Rehab, um, Ditch the Hustle Culture and Thrive Again. Um, and it's available now on, my, on Amazon and on my website. And it really focuses on my story of burning out as a corporate executive in corporate America after 20 years, the process that I went through to kind of understand that the hustle culture was at the root of that and how to ditch my relationship with it and pivot back into thriving in my life. Um, And again, whether you're staying in corporate America or going out on your own, um, the process really works for either. And it tells the story that I went through, plus the story of 300 other executive women that I interviewed for the book. 300. That is amazing. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, (laughs) I'm excited to get my hands on that. We will absolutely include that on the website and the show notes so everybody can get a a copy and pick that up for themselves to read. That's incredible. 300 women. I can't imagine how long that took to do. So you clearly did your research. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I did. It was definitely an interesting piece too, because I, I didn't intend to make it with uh, uh, including all of these stories. But as people started sending, oh, you've got to hear my story and what you said describes exactly like what my niece went through. You got to talk to her. I just had so many times where I would just have days of talking to five different people on Zoom and hearing these stories. So much a blend of inspiring and triumphant, but also heartbreaking and frustrating. And so um, I felt like I would be doing them a disservice if I didn't include them in the book. So it was exciting to to be able to do that. 
Well, absolutely. And I think that that is what's so interesting. It sounds like that's really a theme of your book that your experience was not unique, unfortunately, that we are seeing this across the board. And I know for myself as a psychologist, and I also do career coaching, I'm seeing this a lot myself. And I know you speak a lot about hustle culture. We hear that buzzword. I think a lot of us, we get sucked into it without even realizing it a lot of the time. And, you know, you you mentioned, you know, these these three human needs that keep us hooked on this. And so I'm curious if you could really define for the audience how you see hustle culture playing out and these three human needs that keep us perpetuating in this cycle. Yes, absolutely. Well, you're going to love this because I bring in some theory as a psychologist that I'm sure hopefully you'll, it'll resonate with you. But we actually go back all the way to Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, to think about that. Because when we think about what keeps us hooked on that hustle culture, and you think about that pyramid, for those of us where high school might have been a little bit distant, I'll remind you of what's included. Um, that bottom layer is those physical needs, you know, the safety and water and food and shelter. And once those needs are met, then we're freed up to pursue connection and purpose and belonging and esteem and self-actualization. And what I found in some of the research and in all of the stories of the women that they shared with me is so often we get stuck in that uh, that level of physical survival that maybe they're, we're raising toddlers. Maybe we actually came from a war zone. Maybe you know there's things that are really um, keeping us stuck. Maybe we've lost our job and we're really focused on making sure we can provide for our family. And often what we find is those behaviors that keep us surviving long after that threat is gone, those behaviors stick around. And so we're saying, oh, I have to stay in this terrible abusive job because I have to feed my family when actually you might have just enough to feed your family, but you're stuck in those same patterns and feeling like you can't get out, right? So that's the first need is that, that safety and security that sometimes the hustle culture makes us feel like if I do, 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 then that's producing activity. And that is is a, is a replica for that. I'm safe as long as I'm producing and performing. Uh-huh. The second one um, of connection, uh, which we all need as humans, um, often, you know, there's this whole performance culture that and, and that the, the uh, hustle culture really encourage us to, us to chase. And so we think, oh, okay, well, I'll feel important. And that kind of gets into esteem too, of if I actually am doing enough, then I can connect with other people that are doing enough, or they'll see me as somebody who's valuable um, and producing a lot, as opposed to what are the things you're producing and are you running yourself ragged? Um, and then the final piece is purpose as we move up that ladder that a lot of times, instead of chasing either a really tough problem that we think we can solve in the world or doing something that maybe feels more purposeful to us, we're allowing the purpose of the company that we're working for, the boss that we're working for, the purpose of just being busy for the sake of being busy in activity, um, become the thing that we're doing it for. And instead of that hustle as a means to an end, that we're doing it to provide for family, we're doing it because we believe in our career, it becomes the end and of itself. And so those are the three needs that I see most often um, people trying for, you know, safety or to, f- or to feel like they're making a connection or to feel purposeful. And the hustle culture comes in as this shiny object and alternative to actually getting true connection. Uh, that is so well said. I've never heard that connection to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I really like that. That's a really nice way to frame it. And I'm curious what you think about this as somebody, it sounds like, who sees all sides of the coin here. Where do you think this change in hustle culture is going to happen? Is it going to be employees collectively coming together and saying enough is enough? Is it a top-down approach of executives saying, we see this is not healthy? How do we change this? Is it a bit of both? I mean, how do we actually create these changes? Yes, I think it's a great question. And that was one I wrestled with when I wrote the book, because as a as a consultant for 20 years, I said, I can't just point out the problem if I don't actually give people some solutions and, and think about how they can frame that. And I think the answer is definitely bottom up and top down. I think employees can take some ownership in that. I think the C-suites of corporate America, um, often people, and this might speak to you, are only running on a set of beliefs that are only as high as their own healing, right? So often they're running companies and they only see safety and security and, oh, everyone here has to, you know, give 80 hours a week so that they can send their kids to college or provide for their family. So I'll work them extra hard and that's what they want, as opposed to backing up and saying, 
is that really what my employees want? And am I running on this old set of beliefs? So I think it has to come both top down and bottom up. Um, but where I really focused in the book and on my coaching is the point of impact where I think we can have the most change is individual leaders. When we're actually leading ourselves um, in a way that feels intentional and authentic, and then we're able to lead others in that same way, we can start to influence the spheres around us um, and change organizations from the inside out, build new organizations that feel more purposeful or solving the problems that are most impactful for you, um, and be begin to work both up that ladder and down that ladder um, so that we can really work on both sides of the equation. Because I think the individuals um, sometimes hold the hustle culture in place and sometimes systems hold the hustle culture in place. And so change needs to come from both sides. And, and the way that I think we can start that is in individual leaders becoming more aware of ways to lead in a way that lets everybody thrive. Mm, that is so good. And we'll talk in a moment because I know you you specialize in really helping people identify how to become thriving leaders. So everybody get ready for that. We are we are headed there soon. You know, one thing I know you talk about a lot as well, one of the natural repercussions of all this hustle culture is burnout, right? And we see that constantly. I think that became, you know, highlighted even more so during the pandemic. But for people listening today and they're like, oh, this is speaking to me. I feel this. What would you say are some of those signs of burnout so that people can start to recognize that if it's happening within themselves? Yes. Well, first, I want to address what you said before, which I think is so crucial that burnout is on the rise. You're seeing it in your practice. I'm seeing it in mine. We're seeing it in the headlines, right? Right now, over 50% of executive women are burned out. The latest stat I saw was that um, over the course of a career, 78% of all genders and all ages have experienced burnout. So it, this is something that might be happening to you. It might be happening to a partner. You might have a child that's going through something like this or a colleague. And so even if you're not feeling it personally, it's really good to be aware of some of those signs so that you can take care of not only yourself, but the people around you. Um, and so the, the reason I say that is you're not alone. That's something that's very you know common. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, before we get into the definition of burnout, this is something that's been building over time. Um, when I started to research this for the book and made sure I got the actual clinical de definition correct, and then what I, I saw, you know, show up in the workplace, I realized that the um, definition for burnout was actually changed by the World Health Organization in 2019. So before the pandemic, before we saw kids home from daycare and parents trying to have Zooms and you know, shift workers saying I, I'm burned out because I'm having to go in, I'm an essential worker or I have to be in person. And mm -hmm. before any of that, the World Health Organization added to the definition of burnout this whole delineation of chronic unmanaged workplace stress. And mm -hmm. so it acknowledged without using the words that the hustle culture was constantly, you know, increasing and being part of the rest of, you know, our workplaces wherever we are. And, and again, that's really when productivity is, you know, the thing that we're all focused on. We're running, you know, hundred miles an hour, not stopping. Um, you know, I'll acknowledge that you need to have some hustle at, at all times <laughs> to, to be able to be ready to, you know, get it, get the next promotion or get kids out the door with shoes on their feet. But yeah. the hustle culture really tempts us to stay at that hundred miles an hour always and not coming back down. And that's what we're talking about. When we say, chronic unmanaged stress that you're not giving your body a chance to reset and come out of that. And so that's the definition for the World Health Organization. The symptoms, um, if anyone's thinking about, well, how would this show up in my day-to-day -day work? Um, the first is exhaustion, where you really feel depleted. The second is cynicism, um, which is sometimes a little harder to, to, to discern, especially when you have a sarcastic sense of humor like my own. Um, and then the third is inefficacy, where you feel like nothing that you do is going to make a difference or it doesn't matter. And when those three are together, that's when burnout is really going to start to take the toll on you. And it could be, you know, energy burnout. It could be time burnout. Sometimes what I'm seeing now is boredom burnout where someone's working 80 hours a week, but they're not, they don't feel something. Can they don't feel connected to their job or they feel like it, you know, it's really not making a difference. And so they're just kind of bored or not growing. And so we'll focus on that piece too. Mm, that's, that's great. And, and so important, you know, and it's, <laughs> I really do see this as being something systemic too, because, you know, I have a lot of teen clients, a lot of college student clients. 
I don't think this is happening just in the corporate space. I mean, when I hear what my teen clients are going through with ASB, sports, AP classes, they're burned out before they even get to college, yes. <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. So this is something I think we've all got to take a look at no matter how old we are or where we are in our careers or our educations. It, it's kind of going all over. Um, yeah. But one thing I wonder if you can speak to, because I think a lot of people are listening to this and they're like, okay, I feel like I've got burnout, I, but I feel like I'm stuck in this in this hustle culture cycle that we're speaking about. And I know you speak to how we can get out of this toxic cycle and kind of rehab, as you say. Um, it seems to me it takes a lot of courage to do that. You know, I think it's hard for people to be the one that is putting their hand up, putting boundaries in place or saying, I'm going to approach this differently when everybody else seems like they're kind of head down, marching on. Um, so what advice do you have for people listening to this who who are maybe wanting to rehab at this point? Yeah, well, let me first explain what corporate rehab is, because I think that's a helpful way to think about it. Um, and it's actually an acronym that stands for the process that I put myself through. Um, okay. And I coach some of these women through in terms of actually rehabbing from the hustle culture and shifting your relationship with it. Um, and we joke about the word rehab. I tried to think about, you know, is that the right word for it? And I couldn't get away from it because it really just, it gives you that perspective of, you know, really trying to change that relationship, but also rehab is restoring something back to its original condition. And and that's really what we do is we say, who were you before all of the layers of the world and your job and your responsibilities got put on top of you? And how can we reconnect with that so you can actually lead from this really authentic place? So rehab stands for five steps. Um, R is recognize your life and your story in terms of the context for your decisions and your values and your patterns. E is for evaluate, where we start to look at your energy, we look at the relationships, we look at patterns that and habits that you get stuck in. H is for heal across mind, body, and spirit. A is for arise, um, and that's where you get to actually think about leaning into your strengths, reconnecting with yourself, and think about adding the fun back and the play. So for those college kids or high school kids that are, are working already so hard, how can you add some of the fun time back in and just be a, a little bit of a human while we're trying to perform and achieve so much? Mm -hmm. And then B stands for build, where you put all of that together in a roadmap and get some friends around you to help you be accountable to some of the changes that you want to make in your life and your work. And the book is through is full of exercise exercises to help you do just that and explain some of the, the, um, you know, the, the theory behind it, as well as some of the stories. So that would be my best advice is to follow that process. I tried to make it as digestible as possible because I know it can be really overwhelming. Um, and so I really broke it down to some of the theories and concepts, like things like trauma and attachment theory that help us understand why we get stuck in some of these patterns. Um, and then some interesting things of healthy habits and breath work to let go of some of that stuff. Nice. Um, and things that people can do on their own and obviously advocate getting more support on top of that. I'm a huge advocate for therapy and would love to see it democratized in our lifetime so everybody can get access to it. Um, but really, that's the process of rehab that I would encourage everybody to do um, that's at your, you know, you can get at your own fingertips, which is nice. Oh, I love that you make it so interactive in the book, you know, because I'm a big advocate of values work, especially so many of us, we get lost in the swing of things when we're really not grounded in what our values are. And yet many of us have never actually gone through the exercise of identifying what are my values and what matters right. most right. to me. So the fact that you provide people a space to get really crystal clear on what that is, I think that really helps people make these meaningful decisions. For example, yeah. do I stay with my current job? Do I make a change? Um, what do you think about somebody who may be sitting here today saying, well, is it time to leave my corporate job or to, to keep doing what I'm doing, but just make some shifts in how I'm doing it? What advice yeah. do you have for folks who are, who are maybe sitting on that cliff trying to decide which next, next path on the hiking trail to go on? Yeah. So my, my quick tip on this one is to ask yourself two questions. 
why and why not? <laughs> so in the why <laughs> column is why would you leave? Are you leaving a toxic, abusive workplace? Are you leaving something where you've stopped growing? Are you leaving because um, you need to get to another financial position for your family? Um, and that's all kind of moving away from something or leaving something behind? Um, or are you leaving because you're moving towards something? Is there another growth opportunity? Is there an industry you want to try? Is there, are you, are you just stuck and there's no role, you know, opportunity for advancement? Getting really clear on what that, what that reason is, I think is really helpful. If you're, you know, leaving to get, for example, out of a toxic uh, workplace, you know, how can you make sure that you don't just pick up any of the habits that you're bringing into that situation and bring them to the next place, right? And so just really getting clear on that piece will help you figure out what you need to do or what you're looking for. And then the why not piece kind of comes into what's holding you back. Like, what are the things that get in your own way? Are there things like I'll never be paid enough or no one else would want me. They only value me in this company or I can't leave my team behind. Those are three of the most common things that I hear, especially female executives say of I can't leave the kids. You know, I can't leave the rest of the people back here and because no one else will, will protect them from that that jerk boss or what have you. And really getting clear about that and being honest with yourself, um, sometimes making you say, making yourself say it out loud um, is really helpful because you can understand, well, if I'm, if I, why I want to leave is I've got to get it out of this toxic situation and I, I haven't grown really in this role for five years, but the really, the, the main thing that's holding me back is trying to protect these other people. Okay. Well, that's something you really need to kind of think about what's your job, what's your role, what can you control? Mm -hmm. um, and is there another way that you can get those people, you know, some help or some addressing of that toxic situation that doesn't make you have to be the one that's jumping on that bomb. And so those are the two things I would say suggest people ask themselves is why would you leave and then why haven't you yet or why not oh there's the nugget right there that I think people are gonna just so grasp onto that's so helpful why why not very simple but there mm -hmm. it is and, and I always like to ask my clients too would you have any regrets you know if you did stay if you didn't stay and that can kind of be a helpful way to frame it too now, I'm very curious your opinion on this because you really have seen all sides of the equation here. My husband and I talk about this a lot, actually, in our own relationship. He's very much in the corporate space, has been the whole time. I'm very much an entrepreneur, started my own private <laughs> practice, my own speaking. We have totally different career trajectories we've been on. And he comments a lot. He goes on these LinkedIn doom scrolls and I'm like, this isn't helping you feel better. But he, he comments a lot on how he notices such a push towards entrepreneurialism and almost a fantasizing of do your own thing, quit your job, be your own boss. And I see that a lot too, even when I'm on things like TikTok and things like that. What do you think about that? Do you feel like anybody could become an entrepreneur and just leave jump ship? Um, or do you think maybe we are fantasizing the entrepreneur experience and and maybe it's not for everybody? Maybe the the happiness, the meaning is in the corporate space for some folks. Uh, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, gosh, that's such a great question. Um, I think one of the major things that kind of came to mind with that is I think so much of that answer starts to kind of peel apart. Like how much are you looking for the answer outside of yourself versus are you looking for some of those answers within? Because in reality, it really shouldn't matter whether you're working for yourself or you're working for a company. If you think that the only way that you'll find that fulfillment and feel settled is when you find the perfect thing. And Ooh. so I hear that a lot from people of like, oh, well, if I just was in this, or if I just was in this situation, or if I just, you know, the, I did it to myself all the time in my <laughs> old life, you know, the, the 25th hour of the day is just around the corner. If I could just find the right app or hire the right person. Mm -hmm. And often it's, you know, the situation outside of you is certainly a factor, but often what's keeping you stuck is the things within you. So it's things like limiting beliefs, you know, the old stories that we run on that I'm sure you hear so much in your practice of I'm not enough, or I need to run faster. I always get passed over that will follow you into entrepreneurship. Believe me, if it's something that you're 
experiencing in your corporate life and vice versa. So often I would say, you know, there's definitely people that will, you know, probably have a uh, an easier time making the transition or be more fulfilled depending on your risk tolerance, depending on, you know, what level of skills you've already built up in, you know, one type of, you know, especially in the corporate world. If you don't have a higher degree, um, you know, being able to say, I've got 10 years of experience in X before you go out on your own actually will, you know, give you some credence there too. But so much of that question for me comes down to how are you leading yourself and how is that going to show up no matter what industry and scenario that you're in? And that is actually going to be a higher indicator of your fulfillment and your success than anything else. Ooh, that was so good. Everybody save that piece. That was amazing. Um, there's a clip for us to pull there too. Yeah, I, I so appreciate that answer. And I think that will be really helpful for folks who do wrestle with that for sure. Now, I promised everybody we'd get into leadership. You are a leadership expert. And I love this tagline you have of helping people move from surviving to thriving as leaders. I really believe anybody can be a leader, no matter what title they have in a company, where they're at in their life or their career. So how can people go from that surviving leader to somebody who's thriving as a leader? Yeah, so much of it does come down to the mindsets and the behaviors. And so we work a lot with leaders who are trying to get to the next level to start to look at what are the things that you let run through your mind and either reframe some of those limiting beliefs into something that's a little bit more helpful. Um, also things like having a leadership philosophy that you actually communicate to others of how you would like to be treated, how you expect you know, to treat them in return, um, things like that that can actually set that expectation and the vision for your team. And then also just thinking about how do you actually show up? How do you think about shifting from the me to the we in the way that you think? Right. I think that's a big piece of it, of, of thinking about getting out of that survival, because survival, as you well know, depends so much on a scarcity model. There's not enough. There's not enough love, security, money, food, whatever it is, right? And I've got to rush to get mine. And look, a lot of times this comes from a very real place. You know, we were raised by parents and grandparents and, and family members that did the best that they could to give us the keys to life based on what they knew, right? But one of the, the most interesting examples I've learned through going through researching and writing the book was often the things that form your worldview, it's like looking through a toilet paper roll and you can only see what else is on the other side based on you know what has, has shaped your view. So I think when we think about survival, most people would not walk around saying, I'm just surviving. But when they look at what's happening, there's either a victim mentality of all these things are happening to me and I don't have a role in it. Uh -huh. um, or there's this like, I don't even have time to think about thriving. I'm just trying to get the kids out the door or get to the next thing. And there's no time to actually live their life, right? So we talk a lot about how can you shift out of just that, that mindset of thinking that there's not enough to there's actually plenty. And I'm going to think about how I show up to be able to receive some of those things. Because often what I find is that we hold ourselves back from actually receiving the things that are ours to enjoy and out there. And that takes a, such a mindset shift. So that's the first piece is like, what can I do mentally to shift that mindset? And then the second thing is like, how do I show up differently? How can I put boundaries around my time and energy? How can I think about, you know, the way I treat others by living those values? You mentioned knowing the values, but the second piece is living them. I was on three planes a week saying, I'm doing this career so that my kids can see what a woman who loves her career looks like. I don't think that's what they were seeing, you know? So I was saying one thing with my values, but then the way I was is living my life was constantly frazzled and rushing everywhere and not having time. You know, I would put in quality time at bedtime, but I wasn't there for those 3 p.m. walking home from school breakdowns that, you know, are, I'm now finding in the teen years are even more important. So I think that living of your values is the other piece too, of like, how do you actually pull that through in your patterns and behaviors? And it takes real honesty with yourself to make sure that you're both thinking and doing um, the type of next level leadership that, that you are saying, basically. 
Mm, mm, yes, yes, that is also good there. I my brain is just hopped up on everything that you're sharing here, Jenny. And you know, one thing that I think about too with it, I feel like I see this especially in corporate America. There's such a focus on competency and expertise and being the best and. You know, I, I read this recently in Marshall Goldsmith's book, Amazing Career Coach, uh, The Earned Life. That was one of our Brain Health Book Club picks. Read it, everybody. And he really talks about how admit what you don't know and get help for what you don't know and invest with what you don't know. You know, I, I really think all of us, we should have a coach. And so many executives do have coaches. Um, we need more people in our life where we're admitting, I'm struggling with this. I don't know how to do this. And I... I see that being something that a lot of leaders struggle with is admitting what they don't know. Yes, I, th I think you're so right. And I think the challenge with that too is that there's this internal external pull with that. The internal is we might've either been raised in environments or worked in environments where it wasn't safe to be vulnerable. Vulnerability meant weakness, right? So we've got this internal mind model that we've got to overcome. And then sometimes we're working currently in environments or situations where it's not safe to be vulnerable. There's actually a, a real challenge with that. And the term is, you know, psychologically safe workplaces. A lot of us work in places that are not psychologically safe, where you cannot speak up, or if you do, you'll be punished. And so I think there's this, well, I don't know if it's safe to, to say how I feel or be vulnerable. And then you, you try it and it really isn't safe to be vulnerable. And so I think there's those pieces that really keep people from not admitting what they don't know because they feel like they're going to be penalized for it. And often they are. So I think that's another piece where, you know, you have to do some assessment to figure out what type of environment you're in to see whether it really is safe to speak up. And unfortunately, I'll say this for, for people listening, um, if that sounds like an anomaly, it's not. That's actually um, from all of the 300 women that I spoke with, every single one of them gave me an example of when it was not safe to tell the truth. So I think that's actually something that is a little bit more common than we would think. Mm. That I find that actually really scary that it sounds like that's really more the norm from what you're seeing, that there are these psychologically unsafe workplaces where people are afraid if I dissent in any way, there's going to be severe consequences for me. Um, and that's going to be interesting, you know, heading into 2023. I was just hearing, you know, uh, some reports from LinkedIn saying the tides are going to turn in 2023 where executives and leadership will have more power in how things are handled. The hands are not really with the employees as much anymore. Um, and so I'm curious if you have any thoughts for how we can create psychologically safer work environments, especially knowing that the, the tides of power are about to change, it looks like heading into 2023. Yeah, that's right. I think the main thing um, that when I start to think about the psychological safety piece, there's this real embedding of trust in that equation, right? And so there's some, you know, regulated environments where you have to have compliance and check that people did things and that's understandable. But in general, if you don't have trust, if your employees actually don't trust what you're saying, or, or you don't trust them to get the work done, that to me is the bedrock and the foundation of so much of that psychological safety within the workplace. And this is where I actually start to coach within corporate America on what it takes to build a thriving culture. And so that psychological safety, it stands the thrive stands for starting with trust, you know, okay. first element trust within your organization and make sure that not only from the C-suite, but really at the line manager level, that people trust that immediate team around them and trust that that leader has their back, right? And one way to think about that is, you know, if you are, are assuming that people aren't doing work if they're remote mm -hmm. without actually checking the stats of productivity and see what your team actually did, that's a first place to start because, if you're saying things like I need to get butts back in seats and people aren't really being that productive, if your stats don't back that up, that there's a real issue with trust there, right there. That that's something I would encourage you or your boss to go look into. Mm -hmm. The second piece is help within Thrive. So making sure that you're asking for help, just like you said, where you're admitting what you don't know or you're offering help to others, that's modeling vulnerability and showing that it's okay not to know these things, right? No matter what level that you're at. 
The third is impact, actually, where I would like us to see us moving away from the industrial revolution era output focus that you're only, you know, hours and, and you know, time in the office and FaceTime and whatever you delivered is, you know, your measure of worth, because that sets us up for the hustle culture saying you're only as good as your last deal mm -hmm. um, and moving towards this impact. So away from output, moving towards impact for I, where you're thinking about what is the impact of your total contribution? What does that look like in the workplace? Mm -hmm. um, v is for values. We talked about that a little bit. Um, actually, I skipped R. So that was, was respect. Say, I'm, that was, I'm yeah. for R. <laughs> um, I can write a book, but spelling is not, is not my forte, apparently. Um, so R is for respect. And I included this because there's this great research from Donald and Charlie Soule from the very beginning of the right, Great Resignation that said, you know, notwithstanding the caregiving policies and things that were happening where kids with daycare was shut and people had to leave jobs because of actual um, physical needs, the main need that people reported for leaving their job was respect, that they felt this great level of disrespect. In fact, a factor of 10 to one of any of the other elements. So that just tells you that people are feeling disrespected in some way in their work and making you know choices with that. Mm -hmm. V was values. We talked about that a little bit. And then E is actually empathy, where I think that's going to be, you know, one of the biggest things that we're going to see heading into 2023, but moving forward, we're going to be in a place, you know, in 10 years, 50 years, however long it takes, where some of these functional technical skills that we've talked about where that are so lauded in the office and saying, hey, this is really important, is that's really going to become table stakes. People are going to assume that you know how to do Excel. People are going to assume that you know how to close the books, right? But if you're not leading with empathy and you're not actually setting yourself apart, um, you might win the battle and say, I got everybody back to the office, but you're going to lose the war for talent, right? Because over time, you're going to actually spend so much more money having you know people leave and having to rehire them and retrain them that that becomes a huge hole um, in, a, in a profit and loss statement that I would just like to flag. Um, but but more than anything, you're tanking your own culture, and I think that's what what you know drives down people's ability to thrive right where they are. Mm, uh, I love hearing just such a theme of emotional intelligence in that, and I think we're gonna. Let's hope, knock on all the wood, uh, that we really see that continue to perpetuate in our work cultures. I'm seeing more of it. Um, we got a long way to go. It's yes. getting there. It's getting there. Jenny, one question I always like to ask our guests, uh, because we have some amazing people on the show, you included, you've had an incredible career. What is something you do for your day-to-day -day well-being? Do you have any practices or anything that you do for your own well-being? Yes. Um, so I actually, uh, when I left corporate America, I was managing my calendar in 30 minute increments and 14 hour days. Um, and so I got to a point where I needed a bit of a digital detox and I went back to a paper planner. Um, yeah. So I start my day. Um, with actual gratitude. Um, as you know, it, it basically resets the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic nervous system. It gets you to actually tap into the things that that light you up and actually turns off that fight or flight that we might get into when we wake up and we're anxious and trying to get into the day or checking email. And so I really start with gratitude and I have space in my journal where I start there um, and then move on to what are the top three things that have to get done this day or week so that I can really ground my agenda in my own purpose and what I'm trying to do as opposed to as, as women, especially, I think we so often get, you know, loaded on with all the needs of everybody else and let me be helpful and oh I'll just do this real quick and sometimes your whole day can get caught up with other people's agendas and so I start with just making sure that these are the top three things try to get those out as early in the day as I can um, and then try to bookend uh, the day with either meditation or gratitude doesn't always happen but I try um, to try to reset my brain before um, getting a good night's rest so that's what I try to do to to take care of myself in the midst of so many pressures from work and home and everywhere. Yes. Oh, those are all such good things. I too am the paper planner advocate. I stick to mine every day. I find it more grounding than a tech calendar myself. Uh, and I love that your emphasis is on a gratitude practice uh, for everybody tuning in. Take a moment and write down three things you're thankful for right now. It, it does have an impact. Um, Jenny, last question for you. We ask this to every guest on the show. 
what do you hope your legacy will be? Hmm. Well, um, the book I wrote is really about, you know, helping people thrive. Um, and really that's what I want to be here to do is to help all leaders thrive and whatever that means to them, whether that's ditching burnout, whether that's shifting careers, whether that's doing something different. Um, ultimately I would love for that to be, uh, resulting in healing the C-suites across America, um, and I know that's an ambitious goal, but I think any, any piece that we can all do towards chipping away at that and letting people, you know, really pursue the healing and the wholeness and thriving as leaders without having to try to just be one dimensional, um, leaders, I think would be just have such a huge impact on the lives and the well being of our nation. So that's really what I would love to contribute to in any small way. Well, if anybody's doing it, it's you. What a gift to have you on the show. I learned so much today. I know everybody else did too. It's so evident too, your passion for this. I mean, it just flows as you speak about it. So I really think that's a great contagious energy. And Jenny, tell everybody where they can connect with you, where they can learn more about the, the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Um, so the best place to go is my website, which is www.corporate-rehab.com. You can get the book there. You can see the coaching and the speaking packages that I do for both individual women and for groups within corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also see all the social tags for the other places that I post. I post a ton on LinkedIn um, and then some on Instagram and TikTok, unfortunately, for my children. Um, but you can get <laughs> the information there. So um, please follow along because I'm trying trying to share as many tips as I can freely for those to feel seen um, in both the corporate and the entrepreneurship world. So thanks so much for having me, Dr. Cook. Beautiful. Well, you are flowing with the tips. We love it. I'm sure you'll get lots of follows now on TikTok from us. I too TikTok, no shame in the game. Uh, Jenny, thank you for being on the show. What a treat for us today. Be well. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.